Letty Nowak, Florent Morlet, and Christian Breshnev. And Alex and I will point out their works in the show. Some of you know, but others may not. Uh, Christian's piece is the five-part uh, San Martin sunset right here. Uh, Letty Nowak is this gentleman right at the top left. Uh, Florent is all the way to the right of the entry door in a black frame. Uh, the, the blue, beautiful blue mapped landscape. And Barbara is above the hooded black guy, red and cardboard, at the very top of that row. Um, the last time we were together, a um, different group of artists, of course. We started by talking about the idea of um, making art, why do you make art, what do you think about making art, and how do you like your art? So with all those thoughts kind of thrown <laughs> out there, jump in and say whatever you'd like to start us. And we will do questions, so... Can we start with how we know you? You may, of course. I know now because I used, as an artist who also did graphic design, I did graphic design for men in the early 80s or 90s, we can't remember. But for a number, for a while, for a couple, a few years, and it was a great experience in some one way or another, we have stayed in touch. Um, I'll say how I know Hal. And it's through being in Key West, Florida. I owned, actually I still own a gallery down there for about 10 years. And Hal would visit my gallery. And oh, Lemonade Stand. Lemonade Stand Gallery. <laughs> and I'll never forget it. Um, he started to invite me to go to certain shows with him and Don. And we went, we're going inside one exhibit and he stopped me in the street. I don't know if you remember this. And he's like, I have a gallery in New York. And I was like, I know. <laughs> He's like, maybe you'd like to have a show there. And that changed my life, that one sentence on the street. It was, and since then, I've really looked up to Hal and learned so much, and him and Don have really supported me. But I see. Just a soup. soup. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing my job. Uh, <clears throat> uh, we met on my second day when I moved to New York. Uh, in 1978, in April, uh, through uh, <clears throat> a friend, no friend of mine, already then, uh, Beto Cancela, and uh, there was an opening upstairs, right? So that's just 38 years ago, mm -hmm. and uh, known each other, Beto Frum. No, that's uh, art. <laughs> but I just, I, I probably go back to the late 70s, early 80s as well, and I remember those shows on the top floor. Yeah, that, that was our first gallery, was on the top of this building. Quite, quite we quite. moved here from Franklin Street. And that I don't remember. Yeah, we were at 114 Franklin, and uh, Franklin Street was a great space, but unfortunately there was a manual freight elevator, and the guy who ran it was often on a break. <laughs> and when Robert Pincus Witten came to see our show and ended up walking up six flights of stairs to get to the gallery, I decided we really had to be in a space that was a little more uh, accessible. And this building, had, which was an office building at that time, had uh, two automatic elevators. So we were on the top floor in a kind of the Italian artists who came to show one year. Uh, called it the castle in the sky. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was a very beautiful space. Yeah, yeah, it was. Amazing yeah. space. Sorry, uh, I couldn't leave him on the street in the car. It's <laughs> <laughs> <That's> Coco. <laughs> hey, Coco. Yeah, I, I'm in Spet. Uh, you flew into an open window five and a half years ago. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Oh, my yeah. God. Yeah, in New York or? Yeah, at Lafayette Street. Uh -huh. yeah. That's great. Yeah. So, relationship with the art. 
my, my art is uh, many obsessive and, uh, and, and uh, anal. And I have a period of my life when I have not, not done it, and a period where I have not done obsessive about it. And uh, often it's been when uh, there's been an exhibition. And, uh, my, my, my work is about maps, and, uh, and very, when I've been offered to exhibit, I uh, do a project, a project about uh, the location. Uh, so when I had a show in Paris in the late 90s, I did a whole series about Paris. When I had one in New York, it was about New York. And then in between, like at the moment, I, I, I have a love relationship with my art. And at the moment, uh, I can't do anything. <laughs> but that's my relationship with my art, in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. What about you, Barbara? Uh, I started making art of uh, putting things together in the 70s, and I moved on to making art with boxes, uh, butter boxes, lighter lakes, uh, raisin boxes, boxes with recognizable imagery, imagery mm -hmm. which I had first written uh, a history of for a um, graphic design journal. So I had written about the or origin of these of Land Lakes, the Land Lakes Butter Girl, and you know, all, all of those little recognizable symbols, Mr. Peanut, et cetera, et cetera. So I started making art with the boxes. I showed them at 55 Mercer. I moved on to painted wood, culminating in a fence that was 108 feet long on Wards Island, and a, a 30 foot battering ram, battery park, which is my macho piece. <laughs> And then I moved on to work in paper because my life changed. I had a smaller studio. And really it's been about work on paper or photography or combining them ever since. And then a few years ago I moved into uh, working on cardboard, which I like very much as a material. And I respond to materials. I respond to it when I see them on the street. And I just pick them up whether when I'm drawn to them, no matter what it is or where it is or how dirty it is. Or uh, sometimes then, the dirt could make it better. Sometimes the dirt could definitely make it better. And mm -hmm. I eventually uh, transform it into really a metaphysical experience by what I do to it and what I put it together with. So it's very much about, it's a process, a lot of chance. And so the chance and the process actually keep my interest going because they're always happening. So I can always take advantage of them. I'm actually, after a period of working completely with cardboard, sort of messing it up and I'm working with just the colors of cardboard, I'm now putting the color, other color back with cardboard. So this is short. Mm -hmm. Florent, your maps are often um, collage or just painted? Or both? Not collage. I will, I start, I started to, Going completely uh, imaginary map, mm -hmm. uh, and then it, it, they, they, they became uh, take off on uh, different urbanism, the um, uh, French, uh, the uh, Italian Renaissance, mm -hmm. uh, the New World, and then I started. Uh, doing that on the top of maps or in existing geographical features. So, but for example, in Paris, I took completely abstraction of Paris, then I, I used the geographical features of Paris, and I did a series of six maps. Five of them were five different civilizations, uh, in five different climates. So one was uh, based on a takeoff on Cairo. So you, you had some pyramids on the top uh, of uh, the Butte Chaumont, 
and the pyramids uh, in uh, uh, the west of Paris on, on those hills. Uh, and then you, you had a, a medieval a Medina. Uh, yeah, but, but instead of having like a couple of Medinas, or three Medinas in Cairo, I had like 11 Medinas because I am exuberant. Uh, I, I love to do more. Uh, and then, like in Cairo, the, the, the French came and built the Place de l'Etoile, uh, and the British also came, and there, there, there is a, 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 a garden city in the center of, uh, of, of Cairo. I, I love Cairo, I've been there five times. So, the, so another city was a takeoff on, on Beijing, uh, and, I, and so each time um, you, you can recognize the, the Seine, and, and, and I built the, the city uh, grows. So for example, the one with, which is a takeoff on Beijing, instead of having one forbidden city, I decided that at the end of each dynasty, they build a new forbidden city. But in order to build a forbidden city, you know, there's the canals. So you have to do it in low lanes. So it, it becomes, uh, even so, the, the parameters uh, are insane. But once I've, I've said them, I've become very, very systematic. Uh, so I had something like seven uh, different forbidden cities, and, and I've located them uh, where the lowlands are of the, of the Seine and the Marne and, and, and the Essonne that comes there, you know. Um, and I did the, when I had a show in New York, and so there's another one, there's five. And actually the, the sixth drawing was the drawing of Paris in the not too distant future after the Third World War when the Americans came again came to save uh, Europe. Uh, and there's a, there's a big divide. And I explained the Third World War, uh, the Christian world against the Muslim world. Uh, and at this time, the Muslim went a little bit further in France uh, compared to 770 when Charles Martel uh, stopped them in Poitiers. Uh, the, the Americans stopped them in Paris, so it, 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 it's, it's absurd, it's, uh, but actually, uh, a few years later, my, my mother called me on September 12, 2001, the next day she said, oh my god, yeah. because they come with text, okay, and the text is very uh, encyclopedic, very, very minimal, 50 feet, and each one has a different scenario into the future. Uh, and it's uh, the text is, is, is the text has irony. Um, but it's, it's it's all about uh, human human civilization has been really uh, fucked up. Uh, and it will be, uh, and, and and the president. Uh, and it goes into uh, further and further into the future, but we're making, uh, and uh, that's how I work. Question is, is you're, you like to travel as well. You and your work often takes us to other places. This piece is, is San Martin in the Caribbean, and you've done pieces in Bangkok and other, how does that, your work is often about nature, so? I think it's most of the time about nature. It's ever since uh, the late 60s I worked from nature. I did a lot of drawings, in particular the Swiss Alps. And when I moved here, the ocean, the Hamptons beaches started to completely sort of take over in a very abstract way, but that was very much the center of my art in the 80s. 90s and the Caribbean world where I've just come back now and where this set of five pieces uh, was part of an installation of actually six, seven sunsets. The other six were, were sort of in one block and this is, was the seventh one of these sunsets and working there on location doing these very, very quick studies 
With pastels, it's possible because it's like drawing with color. It's, it's very fast. And these were done in one evening, obviously. And I really do have to work very, very quickly to get to catch these moments as we know the sun sets rather, rather fast. And I've just come back from there again now. And now I'm up on a mountain, and it's a very different kind of view, but I would love next year to take my pastels and do another series of sunsets on St. Martin because it's, it's sort of amazing what happens when you have the leisure to just look and then the, the time or the material with you to just put it down very fast. There's no, there's no waiting. You can't be trying to be in the mood to do it. You just have to do it. And it's quite, it's quite challenging. And what he mentioned about ba uh, uh, Bangkok or Asia, I, work, I did a book about my drawings from Asia, which cover about 25 years of traveling in Southeast Asia, particularly India. And we spent over an, a year in India, and that was more architectural drawing, very, very figurative. We did a group show together, mm -hmm. with, uh, which had to do with phallic symbols. And the pieces that I gave were from Bhutan, where all the houses are covered with giant phalluses, which are symbols of fertility. And when a couple gets married, they move into a house and they paint the biggest phalluses you possibly can see. And it's kind of wonderful. I mean, I, we didn't really knew, knew about this when we arrived. And, and at one point, Tim, my partner, turns to me and said, do you see what I'm seeing? <laughs> and it's quite, quite startling, these, these almost chalet kind of houses that are painted with these wonderful, wonderful symbols. symbols. So that's where the architectural work comes in, which is very, very different to what you see here. Sorry. Well, it's quite figurative, but I take off, and a, a house may have seven columns, and I have only six. I mean, I'm not completely uh, about about what is there. I sort of let it. I let it draw itself. Mm -hmm. the, the technique I didn't get. Uh, it's pastel. It's dry pastel. pastel. Yeah. And Letty, you. Focus on people. Yes. And and in particular faces. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so How did that start? Um. I know you love people. You're a people person, but. <laughs> um. I decided when I was actually studying to um, choose something that I found the most difficult, which was the face. The landscape of the face. Yeah. And how to make the face interesting as simply just a 2D painting, not necessarily who the person is um, or my relationship with them at, at times, just the shapes and colors that um, I can put down to make it interesting as a painting. And I guess for me, if somebody sees my work as a painting before they see who it actually is, that's my, I feel like my best accomplishment. Mm -hmm. But often you don't know the people you're painting. No, I, I maybe have met them Catholic. once, yeah. right. But after that, I don't, I don't know them. Yeah. They're, they're not people who've come to you and said, I want you to paint my portrait. It's not about that. It's, it's just about that's your subject, is the case. Right. So yeah. using my marks and color mm -hmm. to make um, a painting. Mm -hmm. So nobody's sitting for you. They have sat for they me. Have sat for you. Do you but like that? Do you like to do portraits? I do, yeah. And I like when people sit, but I find now as things are changing, my work has even changed from, from um, that. Now you can take a digital photo, and you can put it on your computer screen, and you can zoom in and out. You can get really close to somebody's eye, you can zoom back out, the, the light stays constant. And sometimes I wonder if that's good or bad. Like maybe it's better to be more fast. Like you were saying, and I was looking at your, your sunset. When you said you had to be fast because the sun was setting, I thought, wow, that's so beautiful and you can really see that. And I have to catch myself with the new digital age to not try to get every detail, like the seven columns instead of six. Sometimes mm -hmm. that's not as important. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we heard from Florent that he has a love-hate relationship with his art. What about you, Barbara? Do you love hate your art and you're, you're always happy with what you're producing? No, I often am happy, but sometimes I'm doing things that are so 
kind of, um, you know, ugly, then I wonder <laughs> if, it, if, it, if it is this art and what am I doing? I do have that. I have the what am I doing reaction to when I'm gluing, you know, strange, dirty tangles of plastic onto cardboard and it's, that, that's interacting with, you know, some strings and some uh, pieces or I've taken cardboard and I've wet it down and I've mashed it with a drawing handle and I've worked it around and then I've painted it or added things to it and sewn it to cotton. I'm, what am I doing? I mean, I have that reaction. Mm -hmm. Not so much hate, but the question, question, yeah. the question of right. what is this? Right. And then afterwards, then I have you know, another perspective as to, okay, okay, I guess, I guess that's something. I guess it's, all right. That is true. I, don't, I go through that too, like, what is this? What am I doing here? I but then it does hopefully make sense in the end. Yeah, hopefully it makes sense in the end. Yeah. I had a teacher, this was in the early 70s when I was in England at the College, and he told me, I really would like to see you paint the ugly painting. Because I just, everything I kind of produced and just, I wanted it to be beautiful. And I couldn't sort of help myself for it to be at least aesthetically kind of pleasing. And, uh, but when you look historically, I mean, Picasso is one of the most decorative artists that ever was. I mean, there's so, every one of them is, is, is visually so perfect. And not that I'm trying to be that, but there is something about creating beauty and, and and, uh, and particularly when it comes to nature, which is so, so uh, unbelievably beautiful. Yeah. I find that uh, rewarding. I find that if I can pass that on somehow, then I like the pieces. Even though the ones I like the best are the ones that surprise me, that are not at all what I was planning to do. Suddenly something happens and it changes. Mm -hmm. And uh, But, but it's, it's a constant struggle. I don't think one as an artist likes everything one does. It's no way. It probably keeps you working. Yeah. Keeps you working, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I, have, you know, I have an extra reason for my love, hey, uh, which is for <laughs> my, my father happens to be a, a major artist, who's still alive, uh, and my mother is still alive, again, is her. Yeah, they're, they're like Christo and John Crowe. Uh, they're a team, a partnership. Yes, and um, my mother is really bossy. Uh, my, you know, my father is probably one you know, of the top three uh, leading French artists. And so there I was, 13, 14 years old, make, doing maps. And they, my parents asked, what are you doing? Nothing. But what are you drawing? They do nothing. But it looks like a map. Is it a map you're drawing? Yes. Yes. A map of what? Where? It's in engineering. But that is art. <laughs> Both my parents said. And I went like, no. <laughs> but yes, yes, that's his art. And you've got to keep them. You've got to make them neat. And keep that. And I was like, oh, really? So uh, it's like your father's a doctor or a lawyer. And uh, did you feel in the shadow of your father a he, little bit? Or? A father like mine? I don't know. There's no chance. Oh. It's, my, you know, it's uh, uh, he's, you know, intellectually, he's, he's like a, a major force. In what does he think of your art now? He, you know, he, he loves what you know. He loves what I do. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. yeah. But it's not an easy relationship mm -hmm. with my family. But, you know, uh, I'm not going to go into but the details. But did you learn? Did you learn stuff from your father? And did you allow him to tell you or guide you, or you just had to separate yourself from a father who's famous? And oh yes, again, yeah, you know, yeah, but. But they, you know, they encouraged me and to make it neat um, that it was art. And my first show was a, a, a group show of young people at his gallery, at the gallery in, in Bochum, when I was 21. 
uh, and I have never pursued exhibiting. It has come to me through connections and you know, people seeing my work at my parents and going like, oh, you know, uh, and being incorporated sometimes in a group show of my parties. Uh, so being known through the fact that I'm a son, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I have not pushed myself. Uh, and I'm sure that's not easy. Standing in the shadows of love. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, like my mother saying, so have you drawn lately? Oh, <laughs> 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 sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's Do any of you think parental influences were important, positive, negative? Had anything to do with your art? Well, in my case, I'm sure. My yeah. mother was a Jungian psychologist, and she really, she really helped me when I was 15, starting my first paintings, which were very mad and crazy, and sort of Chagall influenced. And I had a hard time in school doing my baccalaureate, and she encouraged me. So sort of doing my Latin verbs to actually paint these funny little pictures, which then led into a first show, and I, you know, and there I went. So I think it, it's it, you can be thankful if you have parents who who encourage this creativity and who also maybe financially help you mm -hmm. when you when you're having a lot of time to to do what you want to do because it's. It's really not easy, and today when parents come to me with their child saying, well, what should we do, should we encourage him, does he have talent? It's very hard. It's to earn a living as a painter is, is, is really not so easy. And uh, it needs tremendous discipline and luck. Um, but if you have parents who, who, who guide you, as I said, I think that really does help. Certainly, I don't like it. My parents encouraged me. I always took art lessons when I was uh, little because I was always drawing. My mother said my first drawing was when I was three years old and we in Wales, where, we, where I was born. And I had done on brown paper, which is interesting because I use paint brown paper now, uh, a drawing of the entire living room concentrating on the electrical outlets, which at a, the age of three was <coughs> my height. So they always encouraged me when I was young and, and drawing. But there was one time in New York when I had done a very kind of Joseph Cornelian little box and a friend was said he would buy it for a hundred dollars, which at that time was like, wow, a hundred dollars. And she said, I would give ten cents for that. And I was like, oh my god, it was really horrendous. So I had to kind of I had to get over that and not show that my work after that because it wasn't work that they were going to appreciate. appreciate. Yeah. Now, of course, they're not here, so there's no way to find out. I, I, I can't remember what they thought of the works that were on the different boxes or the painted, but I, I just, mm -hmm. I guess it wasn't an influence one way or the other. Were you encouraged? Were you encouraged? I, was, I was definitely encouraged. <laughs> yeah, there's always been an attitude a full encouragement and to just totally, and to go for it. Mm. And um, my father was a sign painter as well. Mm. So I think why I have a little bit of the graphic influence. Mm. <laughs> Did you ever paint a bird? I could draw a bone here. <laughs> <laughs> a map. There is some. I, I have, uh, I've, I have drawn maps upon nature, so taking pictures uh, of. Uh, I've, well, in this case, yes, this is a picture of lichen. Um, you know those hybrid. Uh, sort of hybrid it's moss. Kind of moss. Moss. Yes, it's it's a mix of moss and algae. Uh, because it, it looks very much like a uh, geographical feature. And then with the computer, um, I saw the, the lichen from the rock and then choose a blue that I like, that looks like the sea. And so then it becomes uh, mountainous islands. 
uh, what I do, I print three of each, and then on each one I, I draw with, I, I use uh, Rapidograph, you know, the Rotary, mm -hmm. and so uh, each one becomes a unique piece, and I draw with the ink, with the Rapidograph, cities that just grow uh, along uh, bays and harbors and, and along the valleys that uh, the, the, the lichen, geographical looking, the geographical looking lichen. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, that's, uh, this has been some later works I've done using uh, nature. I've done one uh, with, I'm taking a picture of the frozen, I have a house, I just came from the house. A lake house in New Jersey. Um, we pronounce Jersey because uh, there is joy in Jersey. Right. <laughs> uh, and as it freezes and it frees, uh, the surface of the lake sometimes, some winters, make some incredible uh, shapes. Um, Texture and pattern of the ice. And yes, the and, and I took a picture. Uh, one time, and, and it looked like a, an insane harbor. Mm -hmm. And I built, so I, I built upon the print. Actually, no, it's sometimes I take a picture and uh, I, build, I, I work on mylar, mm -hmm. a sort of mylar, you know, and I draw, uh, and then it, it can be the picture, you have the picture, and then the the drawing of a white, uh, so like uh, I would have the, the, just the picture of the lichen of the sea, and then in another frame would be the city that, that grew on the island. So we're going to shift gears a little bit um, away from what you all do to how art is dealt with in the cultural sense, in the larger public sense. <clears throat> Most of you in the room are probably familiar with the trial of Nerdler and Anne Friedman. And at the same moment, we've had an interesting political landscape. Um, and some people think that the media wants us to think about nothing but politics lately. <laughs> Um, whether you want to or not, you're forced to think about politics, perhaps. Um, so, thinking about the whole scandal of the fake <coughs> Rothko's uh, at Nerdler and, and other paintings, and then the political landscape in terms of how that may or may not be something that would impact the art world, what are your thoughts in any direction? I moved from America, Trump gets to that. <laughs> what is I think I, I just don't, I mean, at this point I'm at that stage. You moved from America. I find it so depressing and I, it somewhat paralyzes yeah. me. Culturally? Cult no, I, it paralyzes my creativity. I, yeah. I find myself reading, reading, reading about all these horrible people mm -hmm. who might get elected mm -hmm. and it drains my energy. It, it doesn't, it's, it, you anger I am angry. It, 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 that can be very creative, but in this case, to me, it's it's uh, it sort of deflates me. Yeah. 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 And the and the nerdle thing, which I follow thoroughly, uh, because I knew a little bit, uh, is also sad because it's a beautiful painting. That Rothko is a dazzling painting, and <laughs> just because it, we didn't do it, it's sort of strange. I mean, it it's, it really starts makes you, makes you question about art. This is a very beautiful painting, and from one day to the other, it's instead of eight million only, you know, ten dollars. <laughs> so where where does that where where does that take us? And her defense was that she bought some herself, and of course that's what she what she said. And, uh, so it's, I think we're in a very sad situation at the moment. And whether our kind of creativity, if we pull ourselves together and do work, which I now have to force myself into the studio, I, it's hard. It's, I find it very difficult. 
So we all have to vote for this stuff. <laughs> Really, in both cases, it's a question of of believability or unbelievability. Mm -hmm. There is uh, you cannot believe the things that these people say about themselves just because that's what they've said. You cannot believe what Trump says because he, although he accuses Cruz of being a liar, he is a complete liar himself. <laughs> but we believe what he says, or people believe what he says, rather, instead of checking up on his facts and going further and finding out what really is going on. It's a very discouraging situation. We what, also talk what about, about Trump, the country. What about Trump culturally or his ilk? Isn't the idea really behind him that culture has everything to do with gold and guilt mm. and being rich? Mm. And, that it, and that somehow people who are none of those things aspire to that? Oh, aspire to that. I don't know. Well, what he did on the west side with those buildings, yeah. that he was allowed to do this, and right. that we don't have, that there wasn't a contest of architectural yeah. variety. I mean, if you think in Europe, what for some fabulous great, buildings, for something great. for something really great, mm -hmm. and we're looking at a chain of the most boring, ugliest, horrible mm -hmm. building that but may be nice to live in, but they are perfectly ghastly. Uh, and that's, that's sad. But look at the projects that we built in the 50s, in the 60s, all over the world. I mean, was it back in France, like, like, uh, in Sarcelles, I mean, it, where... The, uh, the, I'm not the, saying it's only happening here, but this was, this we're talking about Trump. Trump I just, I just say there, there's nothing really that particular with, with having Trump build these buildings. What, what was built with uh, Robert Moses that our, our society did at other periods. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a, so there are you know square miles and square miles of crappy buildings. Banal. What? Prison-like banality. Yes, but we, we, we don't see them that much, uh, because we, we're not there. Yeah. <laughs> but we should have learned, and obviously we haven't, which is so depressing. I mean, I, I find Paris myself, you know, I mean, it's the architecture of the last emperor, with, you know, going on and on and on and on, you know, you, you could be in the second or the twelfth or the fifteenth or, you know, the third. Uh, it, it's, it's repetitive. Uh, uh, I mean, I find my work is based because I'm, I'm I love reading about history. I have atlases, uh, historical atlases, and we, we there was much worse times, and it is it is very, actually it stimulates my work. But when you see, uh, I was at the end, you know, at the beginning, the middle, the end of the nineteenth century. At many times of the 20th, 20th century, uh, this you know what's going on with this election uh, is uh, it's nothing particular here. What we have, we have twenty four seven news media. media media, and I don't like reality shows, but this one, uh, especially you know, because I, uh, I I want the Republicans to. Uh, destroy themselves is really fun. Every one of their debates and I'm having such a good time. I have difficulties watching the Democrat debate because I, I think that for me the most sensible person to run this country is Hillary Clinton and I think Bernie Sanders is a nightmare because I'm, a, I'm an extreme centrist. <laughs> like I said, I believe in being pragmatic and, and running things uh, pragmatic way. So I, 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 I have too much anxiety to watch the, the Democrat. Larry who? What? Larry who? Who is the person you're talking about? Larry who? Hillary. Yeah. Hillary. Oh, Hillary. Hillary. Yes, I've been my friend. I'm saying. Are they from Spain? On that note, on that note, why don't we open it up to some questions from the audience? Or comments? Criticisms. <laughs> <laughs>
I have a question. We were talking earlier about value judgments and whether you like or don't like your own work and where you sort of sit with it. And then earlier we were talking about studio space and just how practically as an artist you have, you have where you live and where you keep yourself. And I, my question for all of you is, do any of you throw anything away that someone else might consider to be a finished work? I do. Oh. I do. Yeah, I do. Because there's the value judgment. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we're talking about whether things are successful or not. Or, mm -hmm. you know. So there is that point where you get to where you physically have to throw that thing away, even yeah. though you spent money on the material. You know, yeah. it's painful. It is. <laughs> it's actually painful. So it's that point of pain. But it's pain. usually connected with, Mike said, it's usually connected with something technically gone completely wrong. Yeah. Where I just can't save it. <laughs> and then even if you struggle where they're trying to make it, trying to save it, and then you just realize it's just, it's just not, it's just not going to work. But does and that struggle ever get you? Do you sometimes it, that struggle gets you into something absolutely wonderful. Right. But it, if that still has technical problems, which then are not for me possible to show the work because it's just isn't it isn't right something is wrong with 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 the, with the paint right and it could crack or it could something could happen and I couldn't I wouldn't want that but it's painful to throw <laughs> uh, I just wanted to say my work it, it takes a lot of time and I have not used a lot that's why I, uh, and I don't I have a hard time selling things. Uh, and what, what I've sold, I felt sorry for. Uh, and uh, I, a friend of mine died, Frizo died, and he bought a piece of mine, and, and I sent to uh, <laughs> his family. I, you know, if nobody wants the piece, I'd like to have it back. Uh, and this is one reason why I, I have decided to do print it print editions uh, because then uh, I can share it uh, and I can even sell it. I have, I have still. A question here. Yes. Um, this is not a question to bring up in front of artists and gallery people, but the whole Nerdler Rothko thing raises the question, does art have any intrinsic worth? Or does art have any intrinsic worth? Yes, does art have any intrinsic worth? I mean, I know that's a too topic, but, right. but, but when you think about it, that, that uh, absolute frog, which may be beautiful, was passed off as a piece of art for millions of dollars. What does this mean about the real value? Is it just the market, or is there an intrinsic value to a rock gun? Mm -hmm. And is the value tied to the aesthetic, which, uh, if the fake looks as good as the real thing, then I but yes, we're yes, saying yes, the yes. fake was marvelous. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but does it... Well, that raises the whole specter of authentication. <clears throat> After the Warhol Foundation started in business, for many years they were willing to authenticate works that people brought to them as being done by Andy Warhol. And after Keith Haring died and the Keith Haring Foundation started, it's opened its door for business. The authentication was done by them as well. But Warhol's foundation stopped when they were sued for refusing to authenticate a work. And the person who owned it was, of course, upset that the foundation did not put the stamp of approval that this was an authentic Warhol work. And that person sued the foundation. And that changed by the time the Herring Foundation stopped doing authentications. It really was an example that, that had spread throughout the art world of people who were art experts being afraid to voice an opinion because they might be sued, one way or the other. If you're an expert on Degas or Matisse or Leger or, in this case, Rothko, and you say it is or it is not authentic or genuine, you are open to the other side saying, I'm suing you 
for defamation of my asset. And what does that tell us? That tells us that art, more than ever, is a financial asset. So the, your question is very interesting, and, it, and it's very all-encompassing to, to me. So I'll let, stop talking and let everyone here say something. <laughs> I think that sometimes collectors, they of course, probably love the aesthetic of the work, but they're also buying a piece of history, the story of the artist, their life, and they're connecting with that sometimes even more than the piece itself. You're buying one of a kind, the only one in the whole world. It's like there are a lot of imitators of Frank Sinatra, let's say, everywhere. There's only one Frank Sinatra, so you want to buy Frank Sinatra. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a position to buy a true Rothko, you buy a true Rothko. Now, I, I looked at a couple of the Motherwell and the, uh, and the Rothko. That didn't look like... T the Motherwell, for sure, was not a Motherwell when they published it. Mm -hmm. Now, I, the thing is about the people who, uh, who authenticate these works, they're all in cahoots and they're all in partnership in some way. So they don't really want to sort of uh, commit themselves. They might say, I don't want to make a comment on it. Uh, but I, I think they know. They know what's fake and what's not fake, or else they would not be in that position. So uh, it's all, it, a lot of it is a fix, for sure. Well, yeah. and, and they get paid. I mean, yeah, these, these, yeah, these yeah. critics get paid, or these authentic exactly. people are getting nervous. They okay. spend a lot of money on these experts mm -hmm. trying to convince them that these are real yeah. paintings. Yeah. Um, but the original one is worth Sir. the ball of money. Doesn't matter. Remind me.